Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And uh, before Pastor Monroe comes and preaches this morning, uh, I know uh, we just sat down and got comfortable. We're going to stand uh, uh, out of respect for the reading of our text this morning. But 1 Samuel chapter 17, and uh, we're going to begin the reading, uh, verses 38 through 46. So let's go ahead and stand together. 1 Samuel 17, verses 38 through 46. And uh, the word of God says, Thy servant, uh, thy servant, excuse me, verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed David with a coat of mail. And David girded his, his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook. And he put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of, and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the beast of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of, of, the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee unto mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And you may be seated. Well, I'm sure this passage of scripture is familiar to probably all of you, the story of David and Goliath. But I want to, the next several Sunday mornings, talk to you about preparing for what I believe lies ahead for Christian people. Let me encourage you, before I begin, to be here on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, if you can. I don't ever want to be misunderstood about what I'm about to say, so please listen carefully. We have people in our church, because of illnesses, and health issues that can't always be here. I totally understand that. So if you hear me talking about being faithful to church, we have a lot of people I believe would be here if they could be here at different times. They can't be here because of illnesses and family issues that may be going on. I understand all of that. With all that being said, if you're a Christian and you're healthy, you ought to be in church. And you ought to be here just not Sunday morning. You ought to be here Sunday night and Wednesday night. And there's a reason for that because this is how we get equipped to do the work of the ministry. This is the place we get trained to go out there and do what God commanded us to do. I can't emphasize how important it is to be back in church on Sunday nights and on Wednesday nights especially right now, we're hearing some marvelous things that every Christian ought to hear and I hope that you will do everything that you can to plan to be with us. Well, with that said, I don't know of a time I remember in my lifetime when people in America are more conscious about their physical fitness. Uh, I get a little uh, humored, I guess, when I drive down the street. I probably shouldn't because I probably ought to be doing this. But I see some guy about my age has his shirt and his shorts on, and he looks like he's about to die, but he's running. And he is conscious about his physical health. I understand that. And uh, one of the most populated places on any weekday, and I'm sure including Saturday and Sunday, is a health fitness center, and they're all over town, and their parking lots are always full because people are conscious about their physical fitness. 
I believe there is another fitness that we need to be more concerned about than just our physical fitness, and that is our spiritual fitness. Why do we need to be spiritually fit? Well, the answer is given in Scripture. In order to fight the good fight of faith and fight for the faith, Paul told Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. And Jude challenges us to earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints. And then we look at Ephesians chapter 6 and we're given the equipment to put on every day to fight the good fight of faith, the whole armor of God. With all that said, what the Lord is saying to us as we're getting in shape for the fight is we need to be prepared. Now, the emphasis in some Christian circles is solely upon the believer's welfare. But, the to- and, and at the total exclusion, may I add, of the believer's warfare. I believe our enemy, the devil, 24-7 goes about and mostly above any group of people, more than any other group of people, he's doing everything he can to discourage to cause Christians to despair, and the list is endless in his attempts to, with always fiery darts, to keep us from getting in the fight and fighting fearlessly with the idea of winning. Now, when you come to the story of David and Goliath, it is a story that we have heard all of our lives. It's one of the great adventure stories in the Bible. I I started hearing about David and Goliath before I could talk. And ever since I've been going to church, which is a long time, Sunday school teachers, preachers, and everybody else has talked about David and Goliath. Over the years, as best I can tell, going back over the record of preaching here at Capital City, I preached on David and Goliath nine times. And I've probably referred to it more the nine times because 1 Samuel chapter 17 is so full of truth that you could preach on it for a year actually if you chose to do that. I'm not going to do that this morning, not in one service, but you could, okay? Now, let's just review just for a moment about this story. David is the son of Jesse in the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we come to 1 Samuel chapter 17, he's just a young man. And his dad has told him to leave the sheep for a while that he was taken care of and go down and check on his brothers who were in the army of Israel. And on one side of the valley was the armies of Israel. On the other side was the armies of the Philistines. And we read this morning how David went down after he heard this giant of a man blaspheming and cursing the name of the God of Israel. And he chose five smooth stones out of the brook. He put them in his shepherd's bag. And David triumphed over the Philistine and killed him as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Goliath was a man. He was a big man. He was a Philistine from Gath. Think about this. When you read this chapter, he wore a bronze helmet uh, that was 200 pound, a 200 pound coat of armor, bronze leggings, and carried a bronze javelin several inches thick, tipped with a 25 pound iron uh, spearhead, and his armor bearer walked ahead of him with a huge shield himself. Now, the Philistines and the Israelites, as you know, were facing each other in a war, in a battle. It is always an era in judgment when you leave God out of the calculations of the fight that you and I are in as Christians in the world that we live in. This has a good ending, this story does. God won and the devil lost. I want you to know this, that ought to be true in our lives. God ought to be winning and the devil ought to be losing rather than the opposite. I want you to think about several things with me this morning as we look at this familiar story. First of all, I want you to think about his obedience 
uh, our obedient, uh, being obedient in the most menial task. Now you know the story of David and Goliath. And in verses 17 through 20, I'm not going to read them now and I wish you wouldn't either. Just listen. David goes on mission that his father sent him on to check on the welfare of his brothers and to take them some food. There was a comparatively, or that was a comparatively simple thing to do. Yet David was willing and able to do something that was small and did not uh, impress many people other than he obeyed his father and he went and gave his brothers food. A menial task. There are many who want to be known as giant killers and few who are willing to be known for just being faithful in the small things. David starts this journey of defeating this enemy by being faithful over the small things. There are those who want to do the big things. Menial tasks are below them. They only want to do the things where people will notice and they'll get some credit and a pat on the back if you please. I'm reminded several years ago when Richard Nixon was the president of our country and he had to resign in shame and upon leaving that office there were some words that he spoke and I, those of you that are old as I am or maybe not even quite that old, if you remember here's what Richard Nixon said before he got on board the plane. We did the big things rather well. But you know why Nixon succumbed and had to resign as president? He didn't do the little things very well. He didn't do the, very, the little things very well. And what I want you to know is this. When David, when David went to that valley to take his brother's food, he had no idea about the big task that God was going to give him. But yet God equipped him to do the big thing because he was faithful over the small thing. A life of acceptable service An assured victory begins with little obediences. That is the first requirement if you're going to be spiritual fit and know how to fight the fight. Secondly, I would say to you, choose God's side early in life. David delivered the food to his brothers and then observed as Goliath was making his daily challenges to the armies of Israel. He was infuriated that his brother And all the armies of Israel were letting this giant of a man go unchallenged. And I want you to look what David said to Captain Saul, the general of the army, in verses 32 and 33. Here's what he says. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art what? But a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. I bet you Goliath never did anything like that. I bet you Goliath couldn't have done anything like that. But David could. You know why? Because early on in life, David learned how important it was to have a relationship with God. God, when it comes to big things, is the great equalizer. Somebody said it this way. God is the great equalizer. He chooses differently from who and what man chooses. Isn't it amazing that all the armies of Israel were scared to death of one man? Isn't it interesting on the other side, as God began to work, isn't it interesting that a young person shut down the armies of the Philistines and took care of the giant? Let me pause and talk to our young people a moment. God can use you regardless of your age. He wants to use you regardless of your age. Let me talk to all you old people. God wants to use you regardless of your age. And God can use you and will use you until he calls you home. There's one thing we can learn. One does not have to be a physical giant to fight anti-God giants. 
When you're spiritually strong, you have nothing to fear. Remember what Paul said? He said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. God's armor, which is cataloged in Ephesians 6, is a one size fit all. If you're a child of God and the devil's winning, it's because you don't have the armor on. Put the armor on and you can be victorious against anybody, anything, anytime, anywhere. I believe that. Thirdly, I want to say we need to be prepared for unexpected challenges. If you read verses 20 through 27, and will not take time to read them other than just a little bit of it, if you look at verse 20, David rose up in the, or in the morning. He left his sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. David left his carriage in the hands of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. Now I want you to notice what happens. This is interesting. Verse 24, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, Goliath, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is come, he, is, he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away his reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? that he should defy the armies of the living God. When David left home to take his brethren food, little did he know that performing that simple little task, I really want to drive that home, his life would never be the same again before the sun set. David discovered two challenges once he got to where his brothers were and the battle was being fought. First, there was the challenge of opposition. That's why we need to be prepared. Because if you're a Christian and you're trying any way at all to live for the Lord, there's opposition. There's in this world, you will have trouble if you're a child of God. So the Christian soldier must be prepared for the unexpected. Upon the arrival, David discovered a standoff between Goliath and his armies of the Philistines and the armies of Israel. Now you got to understand, when God got ready to defeat the Philistines, he had professional soldiers sitting on the side of the mountain, shaking in their boots for the fear of the big man. Here comes a teenager, young person, obeying his daddy back home. And dad says, leave your sheep and go down and take your brother some food and check on them. And he does. Every time you want to do what God wants you to do, you can expect opposition. Obedience to God will eventually result in opposition to the devil. Be prepared. But there was not only the challenge of the opposition, there was the challenge of the opportunity. David's simple errand to take food suddenly become a turning point in his life. Listen to me, church. When you decide to get totally committed to the Lord in the little things, you will have no problem handling the big things that are thrown at you, regardless of what they are. When David was unexpectedly confronted with an opportunity to strike a blow for God, he responded in faith. Now think about this. Although he was the least among his brother, that day David became ten foot tall. You say, what do you mean? He who fed his brothers also killed a giant. Think about this. A shepherd boy, a shepherd boy became a soldier. An errand boy became a giant killer. 
He seized an unexpected opportunity, not for self-glory. Listen to me. Not for self-glory, but for the glory of God. One of my favorite teachers now with the Lord was a man named Howard Hendricks. I've read everything that he ever wrote because he, in my opinion, was the greatest motivational Christian teacher that ever lived. And here's what Hendricks said. He said in writing an article, a book called Taking the Stand, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as unsolvable problems. Oh, oh, that's good. When David looked at that giant in and of himself, that is an unsolvable problem. But when you look at that giant because you believe God is bigger than the giant, the giant is no problem. The giant is no problem. Unsolvable problems and insurmountable opportunities and unex- are unexpected challenges. But this is a life that we live when we live by faith, when we serve God. The question is, are we as Christians as trying to get spiritually fit, are we prepared for obedience? Are we prepared for the opposition? Are we prepared for the opportunities? If we're not, we can't fight the fight. We cannot win the battle. There's a fourth lesson that I want to give you. By the way, if you're wondering how many there are, seven. We're on number four. Do not be deterred or discouraged by family or friends when you're fighting the battle. Oh, that's so important. Look at verse 28. And Eliab, the elder brother, heard when he spake unto the men. That's when David spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, See if this doesn't sound like a family member or a friend when you're trying to serve the Lord. Why comest thou down here with... Whom hast thou left those few sheep, that menial stuff you're doing by there in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart. Well, let me just stop. Mr. Elib, how do you know that? You can't look at any man's heart. That shows your backslidden condition. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Oh, David came down, and once he saw what was going on, he wasn't there just to see the battle. He was there to win the victory. He was there to win the victory. When undertaking a task for the glory of God, you better not depend upon human understanding or support. Many times from the people you would think would support you the most. Thank God for those in our families, and those who are our real friends who understand what the battle is all about. And when sometimes in the battle you get wounded a little bit, you know what friends and family members that really care about the Lord do? They help you, pray for you, and lift you up so the wounds can be cured. Isn't it interesting the person that rebuked David was his own brother? The big brother syndrome. David's big brother was a pessimist. You know what the difference between a pessimist and an optimist is? It's been said that an optimist, I'll put it up on the screen, invented the airplane. A pessimist invented the parachute. And how true that is. David's big brother, he wasn't volunteering to go down the valley and... and, and fight Goliath. He was angry because his little young brother back there taking sheep comes down and says, what in the world is going on? I mean, here are all of you in the armies of Israel. Over there are all the Philistines. And this big giant is walking out cursing our God. And you're scared. You know why you're scared? Because you may know about the God of Israel, but you don't walk with the God of Israel. And that makes all the difference in the world. However, the big brother's anger didn't stop David at all. Then Captain Saul tries to discourage him. So Saul calls David in and he says, 
Hey, little guy, I want to talk to you a minute. Have you seen that guy down the valley? I mean, did you see how tall he is? Did you see all that stuff he's carrying? David said, yeah, I saw it all, but I want to fight him. He's not going to curse my God without me doing something about it. Saul said, okay, now here's, here's real encouragement. Saul said, he walks over to his closet and he gets out his armor. He gets out his battle attire. And he says, here, put this on. If you're going to go down there, put this on. You know what? Listen to me. You can't fight God's battles. I can't fight God's battles on Brian's armor. I can't fight God's battles on my mom and daddy's armor. I can only fight God's battles in the armor of God. And that's why the Bible says, put it on and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So when David arrives on the scene, we read that the army was cowering before Goliath and the Philistines. And what was the thing that motivated David? I want to show you a phrase. It's in verse 29. David said, look, what have I done? Here it is. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Church, listen to me this morning. I want you to hear, if you haven't heard anything else, I hope you'll hear this. If you do not see there's a cause for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up and start fighting the good fight of faith, you're either lost or asleep. Because the battle is really real. I hear people talk about, well, the devil never bothers me. Are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I got some question marks if you tell me that. Because I don't know of any Christian, unless they're totally backslidden and out of the will of God, or they're unsaved and professing to be a Christian, that the devil doesn't bother much. You've heard me say this for 42 years, on and off. I'm going to say it one more time. The devil would rather sell every can of beer and every bottle of liquor in Columbia, South Carolina. He'd rather attack you than to sell all the booze that this city has. He'd rather keep you sitting on the side of the hill looking at giants and doing nothing about them. That's what he'd really like to do. And not only really like to do, he does it. I'm not fussing at you and I'm not fussing at the people watching on live stream. I'm simply making an observation. You don't believe the devil hates the church? There's more green chairs in here this morning than there are bodies in green chairs. And there's a reason for that. Boy, I tell you, this, this really, really, this story that I've heard over and over really spoke to my heart. Do not be deterred or discouraged by family or friends. And then, notice this. If you're going to be an overcomer living for God and fighting the good fight of faith, you must be possessed by conviction. A tenacity that propels, impels, and compels you to obey the most holy instinct in spite of all the naysayers you may have around you, whether they be family friend, or foe. My sister-in-law passed away this past week, and I went up to almost heaven. That's West Virginia, if you don't know. And uh, was with my brother and uh, in the funeral. Sparsely attended. She was elderly. Seems like when real elderly people die, most of the time, they've been out of the picture so long, few people show up to honor their life. That was the case. Friday night, I was sitting beside of my brother. He's 90 years old. And we were talking about the Lord. I was just thanking God, and he was telling me about the testimony, and I'd heard the testimony of his wife. 
and it was crystal clear. And someone come in to visit. It's not important who it was, but when they saw me, here was what they said. I guess rather than singing and traveling with a gospel group, you're stuck in a church somewhere preaching every Sunday. Now, I got my five smooth stones out <laughs> because he may have four brothers. That's, by the way, that's why there were five of them. And I thought, you thought just now you insulted me. You gave me the greatest compliment you could give me because I proudly stand in this pulpit and live for the Lord because I love the God of Israel. And I believe greater is the God of Israel than Goliath and the Philistines. Let me hurry. Make sure your motives are pure. Verse 28 and 29, again, David's brother speaks to him. And David says again that, fa that phrase there, Is there not a cause? What was the cause? The cause was the reputation of the God of Israel. The cause was not even who, which army will win. The cause was how do you defy and curse the name of God and nobody on the, the God of Israel's army does anything except sit there, sour, and soak and let everything else go. How do you do that? How do we go weeks and months and never tell anybody about Jesus? How can we sleep at night when we have a son or a daughter or a brother or a sister or a neighbor that unless they get saved, they're going to perish in hell? Folks, there is a cause. And we better get a hold of that cause. What was the cause that motivated David? Let me show it to you real quickly. I can't preach it. But David was fighting righteousness against unrighteousness. He was standing for truth against error. He was in God's crowd, not the devil's crowd. And he was carrying out God's calls, not the devil's calls. That was a cause. Next, have we sensed enough to know when not to go? Saul grudgingly gave David approval to accept Goliath's invitation, but again, he offers his armor for him. And it didn't fit. Here's what I want you to hear. It's on the screen already, and by, by design it is. If you're going to fight the battle, you use your own God-given convictions, abilities, values, and goals to do it with. I'm not going to go to heaven on mama's apron strings, the old people used to say. I'm going to go to heaven because of the blood-bought Son of God who gave everything for me so I could have everything in Him for now and for all eternity. That's the bottom line. Let me give you the seventh thing. The seventh thing is depend upon God and praise Him for every victory won. Go now and look in your Bible at verse 45 and follow along with me again. I know Brian read it, but I'm going to read it again. Then said David to the Philistine. Now he's down there in the valley. He's got his stones and he's prayed and got all ready to fight the fight. And David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, a big one, and a shield, a heavy one, a spear. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord God of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. Can you imagine this little old guy down there telling that job? 
all this stuff. He said, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. Translated, I'll cut your head off. And I'll give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beast of the earth. Why? That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. You better get this, it'll help you stand the fight. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And he did. You know the story. Something had to happen in David's life in spite of his age, his youth. To cause him to have the tenacity and the willingness and the surrender of heart to do what he's doing down there with this giant. And I ask myself a question. As many times as I've read 1 Samuel 17 and preached it and told little boys and girls a story and camp messages and everything you can imagine over these years of my ministry, it suddenly dawned on me. I know why he had that. You know why I know it? Here it is. The Psalms of David prove that David was a God seeker. His songs are replete with God and praise. He has no problem praising in public because of what he practiced in private. That's why unashamedly, Army on this side, army on this side, one big giant. And when David looks, because of his relationship with God back here, maybe in the field taking care of his daddy's sheep, but somewhere along the way, God gives him everything he needs to stand there alone and face an unstoppable enemy in and of his own flesh. But you know what David saw? David didn't see a giant. David saw God. And God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we even ask or think. That's what the scripture says. So what is the impact of this familiar story? Well, the impact is this. This story instructs us more than just seven lessons I've given you. But here's what it instructs us to do. Are you listening? It instructs us what James said, to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Now here's what I'm going to tell all of you, including the preacher this morning. If you're saved, you're going to face a giant this week. You may face one every day this week. How are you fit to fight? Are you ready to fight the battle? So we have instructions on how to do that. This story also encourages us. It's recorded to encourage us, not to entertain us. All of you have heard this if you've been around church long. Hudson Taylor said, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. So the question is this, are you fit for the fight? Well, David had the right stuff. Let me close by telling you this. Everything I've said about old David is true, and one day in heaven we'll get to meet him. But you know what? Everything David depended upon in the valley of Elah A few short years later, he blew it because he stopped living by the principles that God told him and taught him about giant killing. And he messed up his life. Now, he was a man after God's own heart. But one day when he should have been fighting, he looked up on the rooftop and saw a woman bathing. 
And he said, I got to have her. He got her. He got her. Now, are you listening? I'm about to pray, but don't miss this. He got what he wanted in the flesh, and he paid a heavy price spiritually. Not only he did, but generations after him paid a heavy price too. His son tried to steal the kingdom from him. One of his sons raped his own sister. You want me to go on? How can that happen? It can happen to the best Christian in this church. If you, get, if you forget the battle is the Lord's, and if you're going to win, it'll be God in you winning, not your intelligence, your instincts, and your abilities and your education. And I'm telling you, folks, we got a battle that we're in now, and we got the one we're facing in the future until the Lord Jesus Christ comes, and there is a cause. And we have got to get in the battle and not get in the battle defeated by what we're seeing with these eyes, but understand we are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. Pray with me.